Guys, it is so good to be with you, and uh, thank you, by the way, Gary, for leading us in that time. It is so good to be with you guys. We look forward to being with you the next couple of days. Uh, on your table, there's some handouts. Do not touch them. All right? Because I was going to talk on one thing and decided when I got here that I was going to talk on something else. And you can uh, figure out with the Holy Spirit if it was for you or somebody else uh, after we're finished tonight, okay? The Scripture says that uh, we really don't have any business uh, managing the household of God if we're not doing a good job managing our own household. And so I want to talk about marriage. And uh, I know some of you don't have your spouses with you, so you could take notes for them and go home and tell them what they ought to be doing when you get home. And there may be a few of you who are not married, and uh, about 95% of this will apply to you as well. So I want to just jump in and uh, talk about uh, the keys to a healthy marriage. And uh, I think one of the things that we all can agree on is that, first of all, that love is a key to a healthy relationship. And love, as we know from the Scripture, is not a feeling. Uh, the world basically defines love as a feeling. People talk about falling in love as if you're walking down the street one day and you're not paying attention and you fall in love. And then once you fall in love, this big hole in the ground and you can't get out of it, you have to marry this person. The problem with that kind of understanding of love as being a feeling is if you can fall in love, you can also fall out of love. And all of you have had the experience of having a couple come to your office and saying, you know, we're thinking about getting a divorce and you ask them, what is the problem? And they give you this answer, well, we just don't love each other anymore. And so they feel like they're being genuine. They think they're being authentic because they're just living out what they can't help. They, they couldn't do anything about being in love, and they can't do anything about being out of love. And when you press down deeply, you find out that they've been treating each other like dirt for five, six, seven years, and they've killed all the feeling. They're way past angry. It'd be great if they were angry because you could work with that emotion. But they don't have any feeling for all, uh, at all for each other. They've had to cut off their feelings to protect themselves from the other person. And because they don't feel anything toward the other person, then they feel like they have to get out of the relationship. We know from Philippians, the second chapter, that love is a choice. And it is a choice to know and then to meet the needs of another person. Don't merely look after your own interests, but also the needs of another and there was a time when all of us stood before God and man and we pronounced that we were going to love somebody till death do us part. Forsaking all others, cleave only unto them to love them. And, and there wasn't a caveat there. There wasn't an asterisk there that says, I'll love them when I feel like it. It says, I will love them. And so God calls on all of us to independently be responsible to love our spouse. That is to know, it's not about a feeling, to know and then to meet the needs that we know about. And guys, you know, there's a special command to us to live with our wives in an understanding way because we're, we're more stupid than our wives. And because we're not wired as relationally and that works in some areas to get some things done, but because we're not wired, we have to pay more attention to the actual needs of our spouse. Uh, how many of you, how many in the room have been married for over 25 years? Would you raise your hand? All right. That's a lot of folks. That's a bunch of old people in this room. <laughs> how many of you have been married uh, over 30 years? Will you raise your hand? All right. How many of you have been married for over 40 years? Will you raise your hand? All right. Those of us who've been married over 40 years have learned that our spouses have needs that we don't have. And what we've learned by the hard way is that in the beginning, we used to judge our spouse. We used to say, they can't have that need. That's impossible for them to have that need because I don't have that need. Now, I don't know where the rest of you are on that continuum of understanding that. But to love is a choice to know and then to meet somebody else's need. What would happen if you only went to work when you felt like it. Now, just stay with me on this guy. We know the answer to that question. We would lose our jobs. In the same way, people get up and they go to work even though they don't feel like it because they know they don't have a choice. But the truth is, is that people stop loving their spouses because they don't feel like it. 
And we need to come back, all of us, especially those of us who lead the Lord's church, come back to that commitment to say, I will love my spouse. I'll love my spouse when I feel like it. I'll love my spouse when I don't feel like it. You say, well, Steve, that's not, that's not genuine. That's hypocritical. No, that's called obedience because we're commanded to love one another. And it's not about feeling. It's about commitment and to come back to that commitment of love that is a choice. The second key, I believe, to a healthy, God-honoring marriage is acceptance. Now, here's what I mean by acceptance. Uh, To accept the fact that when we marry another human being, we marry another sinner. And that they will never be everything that we need for them to be. And they certainly will not meet all of our needs. The scripture says that Jesus has promised to meet all of our needs according to the riches of Christ Jesus. He didn't say, I'm going to meet all your needs according to the riches of Christ Jesus unless your spouse doesn't cooperate. Then you're out of luck. But here's the reality, guys. The reality is that many times we look to our spouse to meet a certain need. And then when they don't meet that particular need in our life, we get desperate. And we think that because they're not acting the way we want them to act or they're acting the way we don't want them to act, that we're in trouble, that we're not going to be happy. And so then what we have to do is we have to begin to manipulate and pressure them. We have to punish them because we're desperate for them to meet that need. And what we've really done is we have made them our God. We've deified our spouse. Uh, My wife is not with me tonight. She's uh, back at uh, the little house that we're renting here for a few days. Uh, She just finished... uh, uh, therapy for cancer on Wednesday of uh, this week, and uh, or last week rather, and uh, this is a, a great time of uh, of recuperation for her. She had uh, found out she had breast cancer in October, had surgery in November, started chemotherapy the day after Christmas, and then for the last six and a half weeks she's been going through radi- radiation, and the prognosis is really good. The Lord has blessed uh, us in that. We would have been blessed whether the prognosis had been good or not. Because he just has that ability, as you know, as many of you have gone through a similar thing. It's a very uh, uh, large club, this cancer club. Uh, but he redeems things. In fact, the, the doctors are now telling us that uh, she has a greater chance of being killed with me driving a car than from cancer. So that's the good news. Uh, but uh, uh, in the process of being married now for 40 years, what I found out is that Marcia makes a really great wife. She makes a terrible God. And when I start depending on her to make me happy, for her to do the things I think she must do in order for me to be satisfied or for me to be successful or me to look good, then I begin to pressure her. And when I begin to pressure her, I've stopped keeping the first commitment. And that is to love her. Now, here's, here, here's the reality. There's a thing that goes on that uh, I'm going to call the um, expectation to reality gap. And all of us have experienced it. This is expectations of what we think we're going to get out of marriage or any relationship. And this is the reality of where we're actually living in real life. People with faults, people who are sinners just like we are. And, and the difference between those two guys, the difference between those two right there, and that marker is worthless. The difference between those two things, that one is worthless too. <laughs> Somebody find me another marker here in just a minute because I'm going to need another marker. The distance between the two is how angry we are, how depressed we are, how disappointed we are, how fearful we are. Now, here's what God wants us to do. God wants us to communicate, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. He wants to communicate with each other, express our needs with each other so that we raise reality up. He wants us to mature. He wants a a spiritual formation to go on in our life so that we become more like Christ and reality comes a little higher and we are more in a marriage, uh, 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 an icon, a representation of God's relationship with his people. But we also, I believe, a part of this, and this is the acceptance thing, is that we need to lower our expectations. 
and stop trusting in our spouse to be our God or to meet all of our needs. Now, what that allows us to do is to have a gap that's right here. I don't think you can handle that much anger. I think you can handle this much anger, this much fear, this much depression. And what that allows us to do then is that allows us to come to our spouse and to tell them what our need is, to ask them to meet our needs, but not feel the pressure to have to manipulate them to be that person that they can't be. Thank you, Carter. And so that brings us to communication. Oh, man, that's a great marker. And that's how we talk to each other because we have a realistic expectation about the role that our spouse plays in our life. Here's, here's what I've experienced with Marsha, and she has with me. Uh, I come to Marsha sometimes and I tell her about a perceived need that I have, at least from my perspective, and one that I think that God wants to give her the privilege to meet in my life. <laughs> and here's the reality. This has been my experience. The reality is about half of the things that I asked Marcia to do or not do, about half of them, she should say no to because I'm being unrealistic. I'm asking for things that are not fair to her or it's not uh, right for her to do. Uh, she would actually hurt me if she said yes to those things because she'd be enabling my selfishness, okay? About half of the things. I, I'm just figuring this. I don't have a Bible verse for this, by the way. About half of the things that I come to ask Marcia when we get to heaven one day, she'll find out that she should have said yes to, okay? In reality, she says yes to only about half of those, okay? Now, we're talking about expectations now. And the reason that she only says yes to half of the things that she should say yes to is because she's a sinner too. And you could reverse this, and the same thing is true with the way I respond to her request. Is everybody following me right now? So that means that three out of four times that I come to request with Marcia that makes sense in my mind, it seems reasonable to me, she should say no two of the time. She sh should say yes two of the times. She only says yes one of the time. So one only one out of four times am I going to be happy. I used to fly into the airport and they would lose my luggage and I would get really upset until I started figuring out the odds. And what I realized is that every 10th time I fly anywhere in the United States, on average, they're going to lose my luggage. And so now that I've accepted that, I don't get angry anymore. I land, my luggage doesn't come out and say, oh, it's this time. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad to get that over with. You hear what I'm saying about acceptance, guys? We live in a fallen world, don't we? We're married to another sinful human being who needs grace. And by the way, we do too. And wouldn't it be great if our families were a grace place where we continue to freely communicate to each other that we have needs, but we're looking to God to meet that need. And here's the truth. There are some needs that God wants to meet through your spouse that your spouse, because they're a sinner like you are, are not going to meet that need that does not frustrate God. God will meet that need in a legitimate, biblical, sometimes supernatural way. And he wants to do it to them. If, if they don't cooperate with him, they just miss out on that one. But you're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Now, I know that I'm talking to a bunch of preachers tonight. I understand that. And I was sitting there, and the, and the devil was saying to me, Stroop, you can't talk to them about this. They already know all this stuff. And I said, yeah, and they're not doing it. <laughs> it's one thing to know it. You guys, every one of you have preached this. But the reality is, guys, we're in process, aren't we? And, and we don't all have a good handle on this. And what I want to do is just, as we begin this weekend, just to call us back to the most important relationship that we have other than the relationship that we have with the Lord, and that is with our spouse. And to realize, friends, that we limit our prayer life. We limit our ministry effectiveness. We limit everything we do if we're not growing in this area. And that relationship with our spouse is not becoming sweeter and sweeter every day. All right?
And so the last thing is communication. And just because I know that some of you guys are going to get really ticked off if I don't use a Bible verse, I'm going to use a Bible verse. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, there's a wonderful, wonderful text there that talks about communication. In verse 25 of Ephesians 4, it says this, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully, to his neighbors for we're members of one another guys the context of this obviously is talking about the church but if the church if in the church we are members of one another how much more are you as husband and wife members of one another married one flesh uh brothers and sisters in christ a part of uh, of coming closer to christ coming closer to one another uh verse 26 says in your anger do not sin do not let the sun go down in your anger or while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I'm going to skip down to verse 29 that says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for the building up of the other according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. And listen to what he says there in verse 32. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, what does he say there about how we're to communicate with each other? He says there's four things that mark the biblical communication between anybody that has a conflict. One is that it is clear. And I apologize in advance. These all start with the same letter. I can't help myself. The second is that it is calm. He says uh, in Ephesians 4.25, he says, speak truth one another, with one another for we're members of one another. He says in Ephesians 4 verse 15, speak the truth in love. So he says, speak the truth. But he says, speak it in love. Now, guys, we need to hear both of those commands. But we also need to understand that some of us need to hear one of those commands more than another command. You see, for those of us who have a tendency to be powders, he says, be clear, speak the truth. And those of us who tend to be shouters, he says, do it with calmness and love. Now, I want to just take a poll here make sure you guys are with me tonight. When you're not communicating in a biblical fashion, how many of you have a tendency, well, let me describe a powder. A powder, when a powder gets angry, when a powder, a powder gets hurt, they just, countenance just change a little bit. And you say to a powder, oh, honey, is there anything wrong? And they say, no, nothing's wrong. And they start slamming around communicating by Morse code in the kitchen, all right? And what they're really saying is, of course, there's something wrong. I'm making it very clear that something's wrong, but I'm not about to tell you that something's wrong because you might apologize, and I'm not finished punishing you yet with my silence. Okay? These are very self-righteous people, by the way, too. Okay? How many of you, when, uh, when you're not communicating biblically, have a tendency to be a powder? Would you raise your hand? Just raise it up. Okay, great. All right. Let's talk about the other side. The other side is a shouter. You never have to wonder what a shouter is mad about. They will tell you. And let me just go ahead and say this. A shouter doesn't always raise their volume. Sometimes they just increase their intensity. And they can whisper to you and tell you in outline form how stupid you are so you'll never disagree with them again. How many of you are basically shouters? All right, would you raise your hand? All right, how many of you are switch hitters? You go either way. Would you raise your hand? No, no, keep your hands up because these are very talented people. I want you to see these folks. Okay. He says to the powder, you've got to speak the truth. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says if there is that gap between your expectation and your reality and it bothering you at any level at all, you have got to talk about it. You have a command from God to talk about it. Now, some of you have, don't want to do that because you're married to a very verbal person. And you know that when you talk about it, you always get overruled. You always get outshouted. You all, someone outlogics you. And as a result, you just decide you're not going to crawl into that boxing ring anymore. 
because you lose every time. Guys, this is not about you winning or losing. It's about you obeying God. And God says, if there's an expectation gap, then you've got to speak the truth in love. If your needs are not being met, as far as your perspective is, you have to speak the truth in love. And you say, but Steve, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't have anything to do with changing anything. When did we stop? When did we start obeying God? Only when we could see immediate results. When he told us to do something. You see, your spouse's job in marriage is to know and to meet your needs. And they can't know your needs if somewhere along the line you stop telling them your needs. And we've all counseled couples where somebody's just kind of gone in their shell and they just hold it in and they hold it in and they hold it in. And then one day all of a sudden they just declare they're leaving the marriage. That's the result of that. Well, I told him 10 years ago this was bothering me. And what happens is, see, see what happens is when, when, we, when we get angry, it's toxic. And we need to, for our own benefit, we need to express that in the way that he's told us. But then he says, we've got to do it in a way that is calm. Don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth. We've got to do it in a clear and a calm way. The other thing he says is it's got to be current. What does he say there? He said, do not let the sun go down in your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Uh, A lot of times when I'm counseling a couple, uh, one or the other will get historical. And what they do is they begin to name everything since the beginning of the relationship that the other person has done, and they've kept an account of it. And, And a lot of times what will happen is that we we hold up our anger, we we repress our anger, we suppress our anger, and then it all comes out at one time. Now, here's what happens: it's it's the 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 anger is as a toxin; it's a poison, and if it's held in, it will poison you. It will give you uh, migraine headaches. It will give you uh, ulcers. There are form, some forms of cancer that are caused, scientifically they've determined, are caused by repressed anger and the chemicals that are released in the body. And what happens is we push it down and we push it down and we push it down and we push it down. Guys, anger has a shelf life of about 100,000 years, a half-life rather. And it's, going, it's not going away. And then one of these days at the most inappropriate time, it all comes out. And what happens is we just kind of throw up on somebody emotionally. And they're standing there dripping with the vomit of our anger. And they don't know wh- where it came from. Because it's not just about the one thing that happened. It's the 23 things that we never spoke the truth about currently. And here's the, here's the weird thing about that. We remember all the bad feelings. We don't even remember what caused the individual situation that caused all those issues and so we can't resolve them because we haven't been current about it now here's the bible says and you, you're familiar with the scripture the bible says do not let the sun go down in your anger i don't believe that that's literal like if if you have a if you if you have a problem with your spouse and it's like three minutes to sundown that you got to resolve it just call me crazy but i think it's like saying within a 24-hour period you know, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning you guys are arguing about having sex or not having sex and somebody's got to get up and go to work tomorrow morning, it's probably best to put that off to discussion tomorrow evening when both people are rested. And, and so, but within a reasonable time when everyone can remember why there's a conflict there, we resolve that issue. And then the last thing he says is he says it needs to be constructive. It says, do not, it says, do not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only such a word that builds up the other and gives grace to the one that's hearing it. In other words, it gets on the solution side. See, many times when we come and we speak what we think is truth, which we think in love to another person, it's all about criticizing, it's all about judging, it's all about commanding, it's all about demanding. And what it needs to do is get on the solution side. That says, hey, this is what I perceive. I could be wrong about this. I know you didn't mean to do this, but when you did this, it made me feel this way or it hurt me or kept me from having a need met in my life. The next time that something like that happens, can we agree that we're going to do it this way or that? Uh, When you put your conversation through that sieve, through that matrix, 
that it's got to be on the solution side, that it's got to solve the problem. It's got to add to knowledge. It's got to add to love. It's got to add to resolve. That holds back a lot of things that we want to say a lot of times. It means that we don't pronounce what the answer is to the other person or command them. It means we don't quote scripture at them. It means we declare truth as we see it in terms of our need. And we invite the other person to meet that need all the time knowing that God's going to meet the need if they don't. So they're invited. But that our love does not depend upon them responding to what we've said. Clear, calm, current, and constructive. Now, which one do you have trouble with? See, all of us have trouble with one of those, or maybe several of those. And I think part of being self-aware and being honest and allowing God to work in our life is to pray the prayer that David prayed when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. I think we need to pray that prayer about how we talk to each other and how we communicate our needs to one another. Now, very quickly, just to give a practical word here about resolving what seems to be sometimes mutually exclusive needs. Now, you need to know my bias. Here's my bias. I believe that God in his sovereign will has put you with exactly the person you need to be married to. And I believe that God even knows the weaknesses, the flaws, the sin of your spouse and knew that you needed someone with those weaknesses, flaws, and sin in your life. Now, sin is never God's will, but he knew because of his foreknowledge, he knows all of that. And he knew that that's exactly what you needed to have to wrestle with and exactly what you needed to forgive and exactly what you needed to give grace to. If we respond and we cooperate with him, we're actually going to benefit from the failure of our spouse. He can redeem even that. But there are times when uh, it seems like, it seems like, it's an illusion, but it seems like that Marsha and I have needs that are mutually exclusive. If my need's met, then her need's not met and vice versa. I don't believe that. I believe that God gave me exactly the person that he needed, he knew that I needed And he knew what I needed to give up in my own selfishness to meet her needs. And there is never a conflict between Marsha and I that there is not a resolution for. Now, sometimes that takes us years to find that resolution. But it is. And here's what happens. It's like putting together a puzzle. It's like we've got a table there. Have you ever ever played uh, with a jigsaw puzzle and you had somebody in your family who took one of the pieces and hid it in their pocket so they could put the last piece in? very, very frustrating because you know that that steeple goes there and you can't find that steeple anywhere. They got it in their pocket. But here's what happens a lot of times when you're having a conflict with your spouse or anybody else. What happens is, is they're trying to put their pieces on the table and you're trying to put your pieces on the table. Here's the problem is that we keep trying to knock their pieces off the table and shove our pieces over to them. Guys, you can't put it all together unless everybody's pieces are on the table. You following me? And that means when you're having a conflict, and I know you do this all the time, you're having a conflict and the other person shares their need or they share their perspective. Don't you always, when they stop talking, don't you always say this? Is there anything else that you need to tell me? Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Is there anything that you're holding back? Because I want to hear it. Don't you say that? Or are you like me and while they're talking, you're trying to think about what you're going to say when they stop talking? And what you're doing is you're pushing their pieces off. Guys, you'll never put the puzzle together unless we get all the pieces on the table. You want to hear what the other person's need is. Even if, you, even if, if they're wrong, you need to know how they're looking at it. And here's my belief. With every single conflict, there is a resolution. And you're going to find it in one of several places. One of the places that you'll find it is in compromise. Compromise. C-O-M-P-R, it's I've been flying today. Compromise. That's where one person is over here, person A, person B is over here, and somewhere between their two positions, by the way, the word compromise has taken on a negative uh, connotation for those of us who believe in 
the, the word of God. We're not talking about compromising in the negative sense. We're talking about compromise in the positive sense. But what happens there is somewhere between A's position and B's position, there is a compromise. And you come up with a creative third alternative. A creative third alternative. Now, you'll notice I purposely didn't draw it exactly half and half. Because if this person has a need that on a scale from 1 to 10 is only a 2, and this person on a scale from 1 to 10 has a need that's an 8, the compromise is going to be closer to person B than it's going to be to person A. You see, in business, if you want to compromise and you want to get more, what you do is you overstate your position so that when somebody compromises, it hits about where you want it anyway. Well, that works in business. It doesn't work in love. Because, see, my goal is to love my wife like I love myself. And the only way I can do that is to really listen to the depth of her need. Guys, when I'm sitting on the couch and I get thirsty, I know it right away. When my wife gets thirsty, I don't know it that that quickly. I have to pay attention to her. I have to find out. I have to get up sometimes and say, "Hun, do you want anything while I'm up? That's the only way I know that she's thirsty. You have to work hard at finding out who has the greatest need. And the only compromise that will hold, that will last, is the one that meets each person's reasonable needs. And I believe there's always a compromise when compromise is called for that lands just right, that causes me to give enough of my selfishness away and for her to give enough of her selfishness away that both of us are being transformed into the image of Christ and needs are being met and we get to love each other. What did David say about giving an offering that didn't cost anything to God? He said, I'm not going to do that. See, the wonderful thing about you being married to somebody who's so different than you are is you get to love them a lot because you have to compromise. You have to go places you'd rather not go, and you don't get to go to some of the places that you would like to go. That's a privilege. It really is. And here's here's a little trick on compromise. You always want to make a compromise temporary. You want to say, let's try this for about three months. And if it works, we'll keep doing it. But if it doesn't work, let's go back and, and, and change it because you don't want to ever trap somebody in a compromise. No, you told me you'd do that. So next 80 years, come hell or high water, you're going to do it the way we... No. You know, that works with contracts, guys. It doesn't work with love. The second possibility is capitulation. And capitulation is where either A gives over completely to B... Or B gives completely over to A. Let's just say that uh, Marsh and I are living in Dallas. And I get a job offer down in San Antonio to go pastor a church down there. And Marsha comes to me and she says, well, Steve, you know, we've just been married a few months. And, uh, you know, you're going to go down there. You're going to have a brand new church and everything else. And I'm going to be all by myself with none of my friends moving away from my family. I'm not sure I can do that. Well, I can't compromise. I can't say, well, let's live in Austin, okay? <laughs> you know, I, we either go to San Antonio or we don't, okay? And I, and I could say, you know what? There are going to be other opportunities, and I think God's speaking through your needs, and so we, we just won't do that. Or Marshall will say, you know what? It's going to be really rough on me. I'm moving away from family. I'm, I'm moving away from uh, my friends. But if you really believe that God is in this, you know, uh, I, emotionally I think I can handle it. I'm, I'm going to need some extra attention. I'm probably going to need a couple of Plane tickets back to Dallas, but we can do this. Now, what has happened, one of us or the other one has capitulated. It's what I would call a love gift. In fact, that's the best description I know of. It's a love gift. Now, let's think about that metaphor of a gift. If I buy a gift, what I want to make sure is I have enough money in my account that my check doesn't bounce. And here's what I find in a lot of marriages, that people are acquiescing. They're giving in. They're letting the other person have their way, and they don't have the emotional payola to cover the so-called gift that they gave, and so they're bitter about it. Or they keep saying, you know, they give somebody a watch, and then every time they look at the watch, they say, you know how much it cost me for you to have that watch? You don't leave a price tag on a, on, on a, on a love gift. If you can't afford it, don't give it. And here's the reality. Sometimes we shouldn't be giving in. Because we don't have the resources to do it. And if we can't, then let's keep talking about it. Because I I can't afford that. I can't give that gift. Because if I do, I'm going to be angry about it. I'm going to want it back. 
But I believe a lot of times God gives us, God gives us the resources to give a love gift to our spouse. A third possibility is what I call agreeing to disagree. Agree to disagree. And that's where A does what they want to do and B does what they want to do. But they both agree. The key word there is agree to disagree. Uh, There are certain things, guys, have you found out that you just don't have to argue about? You're sitting there watching some news account or some television program, and you have a different opinion than your spouse. And haven't you ever gotten into one of those things where you argue about it and it doesn't matter? I mean, that's about the lowest of stupid that you could get to. It's what I call the toaster test. You know why banks give away toasters when you open up a, a checking account? Because they're pretty, they're pretty worthless, okay? I mean, a toaster, I mean, if you, can't, if you can't buy your own toaster, you have to depend upon the bank to provide your toaster, you're in a real heap of trouble anyway, okay? I don't know what a co- you know, they buy those things by the hundred. They buy them by tra- train uh, car loads. They're, they're probably worth about $11.40 a piece. And that's my test. If the argument that I'm having with my wife is not worth at least a toaster, let her win. You hear what I'm saying here? Now, now, again, this is just my opinion. If I, if I find out I'm wrong about what I'm just about to tell you, and when we get to heaven, I will apologize to you, okay? But see, I believe that whoever loads the dishwasher ought to load it like they want to load it, okay? I'm just saying. Again, I don't, have a, I, don't have a, I don't have a Bible verse for it. I don't have a Bible verse for it, but that's just my belief. Now, obviously, within certain... Parameters, you know, it has to come out clean or you have to reload it, okay? But it doesn't have to be that efficient, okay? You don't have to get 47 forks in there, all right? It, with, the, with the responsibility comes the authority. And you know, your, your, your husband or your wife could do it wrong and you just agree to disagree on that one. In fact, pr- probably the, 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 the phrase that has saved our marriage more than anything, I said, well, hon, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one, all right? You just don't have to do it. There's one last opportunity when you're trying to figure out something that looks like a, 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 a mutually exclusive need. And it's called confess and forgive. Now you notice I didn't draw an A and I didn't draw a B and I didn't draw any arrows between any of them. But I will read again Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There are times when uh, my wife's need is not being met. And she comes to me in private and she says, Steve, is this a good time to talk? Which means I'm in trouble. But I say yes, because I know I'm going to deal with it eventually. And she says something like this to me. She says, Steve, I know you didn't mean to hurt me. Now, where in the world did she get that? 1 Corinthians 13, love always believes the best. Steve, I know you didn't mean to hurt me. But, you know, we had a talk about the fact that you would not tell a story in church in public about me without getting my permission. And you did that this week, and it made me feel like that you didn't care about me. And I know that's not true. And, Steve, I'm angry at you. I don't want to be angry at you. Can we talk about the future? Guys, when somebody comes at you and they take their fist and they swing it at you, what do you do? You do one of two things. You either duck. I didn't say that. That wasn't me. That was somebody else. Or you swing back, oh, yeah, well, you did so-and-so last week. That doesn't have anything to do with my sin, but, you know, it's great for you sin too. If you don't want somebody to duck when you tell them about your need and you don't want them to attack you back, then don't swing. Say, honey, I know you didn't mean to, but when you did this and you speak the truth in love, and it's current, it's not all the times you've ever done it, it's not a command, it's not a demand, it's not a condemnation, it's not a pout, it's not a shout. 
Now, here are my choices. I can say to Marsha, okay, Marsha, let me compromise with you on this one. Let me only tell half of the story next time. Is that okay? It doesn't really fit. Or uh, I could give her a love gift. I could say, oh, honey, I'm such a generous person. I'm going to not tell any stories about you. That's like me going to my wife's closet and picking up a pair of her shoes and wrapping it up and giving it back to her as a gift. It ain't a love gift if I took something I wasn't supposed to take. Or I could try this option. I could agree to disagree with her. I could say, honey, let's do it this way. I'll only tell stories about you when I'm in Portland and you're not there. All right? And you won't know anything about it, so you won't be hurt. No. We've got option number four here. To raise your hand and to say, I apologize. I was insensitive. I was selfish. I was careless. I was wrong. Now, let me tell you why I do that at my home on a fairly regular basis is that when I hold my hand up and I say those words, she does not nail my hand to the wall. I live in a home of grace, which allows me to own my sin a lot quicker. Guys, that's why we're all here, isn't it? Because of grace. Grace gave us the freedom that we could not have otherwise. There's no way in the world we could afford to admit that we were sinners if there wasn't one who was willing to forgive us when we owned our own sin, who didn't decide that he would punish us for our sin so we'd remember it next time. He died for us. He took upon himself all the pain of what we did wrong. And when I confess and Marcia chooses to forgive and trust God, to be the judge. What she's really doing is she's heaping coals of fire upon my head, which the Bible says is my greatest motivation. The devil tells her, oh, you're going to let him get away with that again? You better give him the silent treatment for at least two months. You better cut him off. That's what the devil tells her. The Lord tells her seven times 70. Guys, I don't know of anything that affects our ministry more than what goes on in our home. And everybody in this room has fallen, and, it's, and we still fall, we still fail. And all of us think everybody else in the world has a better marriage than we do. They don't. Their, their marriage stinks as well. We're in process. He's not finished doing what he wants to do in us. But I want to call you to... A renewed commitment, whether you've been married five years or 50 years, a renewed commitment to allow your your marriage to be a model to your friends, to your kids, to your grandkids, to your church of grace, of communication, of forgiveness, of acceptance, and most of all, of love. Let's ask him to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would continue your work in us even as we seek to be your workmen. And I pray, dear Father, that you continue to uh, test us in that area where we are most vulnerable, dear Father, in in the place where we live, to have the fruit of the Spirit be formed in us and to be a blessing to those who know us best. I thank you, dear Father, that the past can be the past. And that you can give all of us a brighter and a greater future in our deepest and most intimate relationships. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.